Who here believes that the world around you exists when you're not looking directly at it? <laughs> Maybe there's two <laughs> well, more rhetorical questions. So we're talking about the concept of realism, okay? The notion that the universe exists out there independent of how we interact or perceive it. My job in the next few minutes will be to try to convince you that this view worldview is not in line with the evidence. I plan to do this by having a conversation about a topic that's really passionate to me, which is quantum mechanics. So you've no doubt, so you've no doubt heard at least something about quantum mechanics. Uh, and we talk about ideas that change the world. Uh, it's given us technologies such as lasers, uh, MRI scans, which is transistors in every single one of our uh, probably most relevant to a room full of security professionals. Uh, it's given us quantum computing, which is destined to break all of our cryptography in not too distant future. So you may have heard quantum in this context, uh, but how much do you actually know about the science beyond the buzzwords? So quantum deals with the world of the very small atomic level and things that make up atoms. Now, about 100 years before the advent of quantum mechanics, physicists had thought they had a pretty good idea of the wave nature of light, uh, as demonstrated by this dual slit experiment. So what you have is a, a source of light and a barrier with two slits. Uh, and the slits are meant to really just ensure that the light only comes through one of two paths. And then you set up this detection wall here, and you gather the result. And what happens in the case of light is, being a wave, it propagates through both slits, generating, in effect, two waves. And then those waves fan out, and they, they interfere with themselves. Uh, you know, peak, uh, areas where a peak of one wave meets a trough of another wave will cancel out. And where a peak meets a peak, it will reinforce. So at the detector screen, you get these bands of light and no light, and that's called interference. Here's some more examples of interference patterns. The key point is that when you see these bands of light and no light, that's characteristically a wave phenomenon. Okay, so what? Well, what if we try to do this with particles? So imagine basketballs. So imagine you have a ball and two doorways. That's what this wall is there. Wall with two doorways, and you're throwing basketballs at the wall. The basketballs that made it through these openings, these two doorways, You'd expect it to go pretty much straight through the opening and clump uh, at, the, at, say, our detector wall behind in two distinct clumps. Obviously, you wouldn't see bands, you wouldn't see any of the interference you'd see. So what actually happens? Good. This is the dual slit experiment uh, for electrons. This video is uh, uh, sorry, it's, uh, remember that electrons are a fundamental component of atoms. Uh, and we're taught that electrons are a distinct particle with a distinct position in space. And what you're seeing is the electrons traveling through the double slit and landing on the detection screen. You eventually see a pattern emerge. You should be able to see a pattern emerge. It's an interference pattern. But interference is only supposed to happen to waves. <coughs> this is another picture of electron interference clearly see the bands where the electrons hit and bands where they don't. So this should seem peculiar. Somehow an individual electron travels through this experiment, which is two slits, two paths, and creates this wave-like interference pattern at the other end. So the next logical thing to do is to say, well, okay, which, which path did it travel? So you can do this by setting up a camera, which will definitively tell you whether the electron goes through the left slit or the right slit. Now the problem is when they do this, when they perform this experiment, something other, another peculiar thing happens. You don't see interference anymore. <laughs> the electron travels through in straight lines, much like in our basketball example, and clumps in two distinct clumps, as you'd expect a particle to do. So what's really going on? 
This is Niels Bohr. He's one of the fathers of quantum mechanics. And in about 1925, along with uh, Werner Heisenberg, uh, he formulated a uh, theory to try to explain some of this behavior. And this is called the Copenhagen Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics. So in this interpretation, when you have at the subatomic level multiple possibilities, such as left or right slit, what actually happens is the possibilities exist in an overlapping uh, form called a state of superposition. Basically, they exist simultaneously. Now, super superposition is a mathematical formalism and really only allows you to predict the probability of a, of a particle hitting a target on the screen. And the superposition math actually resembles wave math. So this, this mathematical formalism allows for to interpret, uh, sorry, interfere with itself. But the superposition itself can't be thought of as real in any way. It's only real once you actually make a measurement and then you collapse the superposition into a definite value. So back to our electron. When we're looking at the, the detector screen at the end here, we give it a choice, left or right screen, left or right slit. Given that choice, it actually it falls into a superposition of both states. That superposition is allowed to interfere with itself, and the detection at the end of the screen is an interference pattern. Once we look at the slit itself, or the screen itself, the barrier, we force the electron at this stage to be either left or right slit. And that forcing of the, the, the electron into one reality that causes the, the typical particle behavior. So, I should say, so this, this is, gives us a spark that we saw in the video. Uh, in other words, how we measure the electron changes the outcome. Bohr summed it up as follows. When we measure something, we're forcing an undetermined, undefined world to assume something, assume an experimental value. We're not measuring the world, we're creating it. So in some sense, by collapsing our superposition through observation, we're actually bringing the electron into But who can perform a measurement? And how does, uh, does it have to be a person? Can it be a, an animal, a monkey, or a cat? Uh, Schrodinger, who was a contemporary of Bohr, uh, expressed his objection to uh, Bohr's theory by proposing a thought experiment. It's called Schrodinger's cat experiment. You put a cat in a box along with an apparatus, which is based on a radioactive particle which has a 50% chance of decaying. If it does decay, it's rigged to break a vial of poison thereby killing the cat. Then we seal up this box. So according to Bohr's theory, since we have a particle with a 50-50 chance of decay, those two options, decay and non-decay, exist in superposition. By extension, so does our unfortunate cat, who would exist in a superposition of being alive and being dead until an observer opened the box and actually made the measurement. So Schrodinger's proposal was intended to show the absurdity of the Copenhagen interpretation. And Schrodinger wasn't the only one convinced uh, that there was issues with quantum mechanics. Einstein famously, famously has this God does not play dice with the universe quote. Of course, Moore had a response to suggestions for Einstein as well. <laughs> but it gets weirder. In the late 90s, a modified version of the dual slit experiment was now, well, don't let this, this picture intimidate you. Grab my quantum pointing device. Along the top, oh, is it right? Oh, I don't have a quantum pointing device. Along the top of this, uh, of this experiment is the familiar uh, dual slit experiment. You have your source, in this case it's a laser shooting photon, which are particles of light. Uh, you have your, your double slit, and you have your interference screen where you would see an interference pattern or, or your clumping pattern. What makes this experiment unique is you're able to, with photons, split to two identical photons at each, at each slit. So you create these pair of identical photons when, it, when a photon comes through a slit. 
one of those pairs goes up into the interference screen and we have our typical experiment. But the, the cloned pair, the second pair, comes down into this measuring equipment in the bottom here. This can to tell you which detector, so it's similar to the camera on the screen, can tell you which slit the photon actually went through, the A and B detectors here. So as usual, if we turn on this detection and we run this experiment, we, we destroy the interference pattern and we get the clumping that you can see with particles. If you turn on the detection, uh, sorry, if you turn off the detection, the interference at the top is a typical wave interference pattern. But there's a catch. The experiment is set up such that when you turn on the slit detection, the top photon always hits the interference screen first. So ahead of the photon that actually comes down to the, to the slit detection. Now think about that for a minute. The knowledge of which slit the photon traveled through is enough to nullify any superposition or, or, or interference, even if that knowledge is obtained after the interference should have taken place. Stranger still, this bit of equipment down here is called the quantum eraser. It, it, it serves to scramble any detection information we get from our detector. Again, we run this experiment with the detectors on, with the scrambler on, and we'll get an interference pattern again. So it's as if turning on the eraser is enough to restore the interference pattern that's Scrambling the slit information retroactively sends a signal that it's okay to interfere. In other words, the universe is, is able to somehow act on our measurement retroactively. It can go back in time and change the outcome to remain consistent. At this point, I should mention that there are alternate interpretations of this quantum weirdness. Each a different take on trying to tame uh, and somehow explain the odd behavior that we see in the experiment. But the fact is, the quantum mechanics works. Regardless of how we choose to interpret it, the science marches on in spite of these philosophical conundrums. But now that you have a hopefully slightly better grasp of quantum mechanics, and knowing that these are the particles that really form the building blocks of, of everything we see around us, I'll ask you again. Do you still think the world exists? Or 